thank you for the, the explanation, Michelle. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> so please describe the organization that you work for and kind of the size, the mission, what they do. Yeah, I work for Merit's IT Services over in Fenton. Um, so Merit's overall uh, focuses on people and uh, motivation and kind of driving performance at a really high level. Um, what we actually do is kind of more like a managed service provider. All of the business components that Merit's owns can come to us or not come to us for the services. So we've got to be the cheapest, the best, and the friendliest, right? Gotcha. That's just the way that it has to work. So you're a service provider to other entities, essentially, right? right. Internally. Okay. And so what's the state of automation at Merit's kind of Transforming is probably the best way to say it. Uh, we're going from the traditional, we have thousands of lines of PowerShell to automate all of our stuff back towards some of the newer patterns that we see emerging that are a lot easier to maintain and work with. Yeah, and being a service provider to multiple entities, I'm sure the automation plays a big role in it, right? Absolutely, it also makes it a lot more complicated. Yeah, I can imagine. So what are your automation goals in that, in that To increase safety, repeatability, try to make it easier to get people to do the work that they need to do, uh, take people from doing the kind of crappy hard work that comes up all the time, all the troubleshooting and pain, and then let them focus on the interesting hard work, like building out new services and improving the conversion for their customers and those kinds of things. Allowing them to be more focused on the business and get out of the, the support of the right? <laughs> Absolutely. There's some things that we should be able to take for granted at some point um, with some oh, yeah. technologies, right? For sure. Yeah. And so what's, what's your specific role in that, in that organization? So I'm an automation engineer on the automation and monitoring team for data center infrastructure services. Um, so two of my team members are here today somewhere, Nikki and Mark. Uh, they're also on the team at the back. Um, so we are the group that comes together and kind of glues stuff around and makes it all function. Yeah, so that sounds like a relatively new role in an organization, right? So uh, from my perspective, again, somebody that's been around for about 17 years in an organization, it's kind of the first I've heard of a team called this, right? I knew it was coming, but it, it's, when did that get established? How new is that? So I joined in June as a PowerShell developer, and then less than three months later, they did a rework, and they said, okay, we're gonna have an automation and monitoring team, in addition to a whole bunch of other stuff, and by the way, you're now an automation engineer, not a PowerShell developer, and I said, okay. What's really interesting about that is, a PowerShell developer role, in and of itself, is pretty groundbreaking and new, right? Yeah. How many people and organizations have PowerShell developer roles today? A couple, I don't know. We have, yeah, we have one, <laughs> two. <laughs> So it, it's, it's kind of showing that it, it's kind of an emerging technology still, and while some of us have been using PowerShell for a while, it's still not fully adopted within, within the workplace. All right, um, so what's the first step when you're impl and implementing an automation team, right? So I'm sure that there's a lot of components going on. Where do you start? You go talk to everybody. Uh, so you have to reach out to the teams who are running operations right now, find out what's painful, what hurts, what they're working on, find out the work that they do all the time right now that they don't have an automated workflow for, Talk about those things. Go back to your development teams, find out what keeps them from going to production or what hurts once they get to production. You really have to reach out across the organization and start building relationships and finding out where all the pain points are because you can't address them until you understand them. It sounds like a business analyst or kind of interviewing other people that are responsible in the organization is really determine where the pain points are and what doesn't work for you on a regular basis. I 100% thought when I took the job that I was going to sit down and write code for eight hours a day. I probably only write code for three to four hours a day. The rest of it I spend evangelizing and, and communicating with people. But for three to four hours a day, you get to read PowerShell. It's <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, so what tools, so PowerShell is obviously a tool. Yep. What tools are you using in your automation repertoire? So lots and lots of PowerShell. Um, we've been moving into some Python stuff, uh, Selenium for testing our um, websites. Nikki's been running with that recently. Uh, we're doing a POC for Chef to get our configuration management under control. We have 16 to 20,000 lines that does all the provisions for our servers, which is unmaintainable. Right? It works. It's stuff. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things, anytime you change it, you freak out. Yeah. So, so even though it's automated, right, it's still a, a chore to manage the automation. Right. It's so, kind of the next evolution. Yeah. We're coming back to changing patterns and kind of addressing those things, looking at how we can build all of our uh, deployment artifacts the same way. So tools like Packer. Uh, tools for deployment like Terraform, these are the things that we're, we're working on moving into. Like I said, most of what we have right now is the traditional. We use a lot of PowerShell, a lot of Power BI, a lot of Python, those types of things. We're kind of taking a step back and trying to migrate to better patterns. So the interesting part about that is some of those tools and, and what you're mentioning, a lot heard of them, they're still very foreign to me, right? So what do you learn about those tool sets? Uh, probably about an hour to an hour and a half of my day is spent doing research and kind of playing around and poking and stuff. I do a lot of it at home. If you ask my fiance, she 
much. Um, <laughs> can't tell you for sure. My wife knows nothing about that. <laughs> There's a lot of good resources. Uh, I hang out in a couple of different Slack teams, um, and I learn from the community all the time. Everybody know what Slack is? See some heads. Yeah, so let's, that's a great example of a tool set that you're using that I don't think everybody's familiar with. Right. Right. So what's Slack? So Slack is the 2015 version of IRC, right? Uh, so it's a way for you to have repeatable, uh, context-aware chat with all of your teammates or people from different communities. All the logs are staying there, so you don't lose it if you log out or come back. Um, unlike Skype, you don't have to forward your conversation logs to other people. As soon as somebody joins the channel, they can see everything you've been talking about, which is really helpful. Um, mostly, it's a, a really awesome communication tool around kind of driving context and pulling people into conversations that weren't there at the start. Right? I don't have to forward emails where we talked about stuff anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, I can say it being very helpful. I mean, even with my group, we have to do some of today. So, um, all right. So, how has automation improved your day-to-day -day operations, or maybe even the organization's? It makes things safer. Is probably the fastest way to say that. So, it's not. So, from my perspective, from what I've seen when I've talked to people in the community, automation is something that makes your day-to-day -day work easier and safer. The speed stuff is all a benefit. Right, that's all like a second order effect. So it's more about reliability, predictability. Yeah, so if you're deploying a server and you're relying on somebody to go through a checklist of step, 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 to get it done and get it clear, if you turn it over to the development team, the development team says, okay, I got it, why doesn't this work on the last one you built for me? Versus what we're moving into now where we have an automated provision piece that'll deploy it, configure it, run tests, and then send the developers the test checklist and be like, here's all the things we've verified or set on your node. Yeah. And then, by the way, after you change stuff, there's a compliance baseline here. So once you've changed and added your stuff, you can run these tests again and see if you're out of compliance. Not because that's a bad thing, but because you know what to go risk accept. Yeah, but that's a really good point, right? So part of the job is to identify the automation, create the automation, and test it. And it's kind of almost like a, a roadmap or a maturity model or a life cycle, right? Because at some nirvana state, you get to the point to where your tests are automated and you find out what's broken and it remediates that. Yes. Uh, Ticketmaster actually has a really good maturity model that I can dig up the link for and send it. Anybody that wants it. Yeah. yeah. Kind of good. So, a couple more questions and I'll get you out of here. Right? Sure. So, uh, so, how long have you been in IT? Five ish years. Five years. Right? Yeah. It's an impressive amount of knowledge that you hold for being within IT for five years. I got 95 plus percent of it from the community. Yeah, I really did. So, that's a really good point. A lot of this is community driven and even how we're getting our knowledge is, is different than it used to be. Right? And then anything else you want to add about automation in general? Document your stuff. Um, I spent all of last week at the Power Level Bus Summit in Seattle yelling at people about documentation. Uh, I know documentation is not fun to write, but it is really important uh, for the people who come to replace you. There's also the old developer adage that anybody writing production code should take to heart, which is you should write your stuff as if the person who's going to replace you is a psychopath who knows where you live. <laughs> <laughs> you really should. Same thing with your documentation. Uh, has anybody here ever dropped into a shop where stuff wasn't really well documented? You had no idea why things worked, or more specifically why they didn't work? I think everybody's here. <laughs> <seen it. laughs> so documentation will help you solve for that. I know it's not a whole lot of fun to write, but uh, there's some good tips and tricks out there for writing better documentation. So, that's so would you say that documentation, and I think I missed this question, is your favorite automation tool? Uh, yeah, so when I look at tooling specifically, I'll size up two different tools and I'll take a look at the documentation stuff. The documentation for me is also an indicator of developmental maturity. So if you've got the craziest, best tool on the planet and your documentation is a readme that says install me and run me, I'm going to be like, ah, nope, out. <laughs> Probably because you cut corners during development, right? You have to get stuff out, you pushed it out, but you didn't have documentation with it. Whereas if I look and see some mature documentation around it, that tells me that your design process was thought out and planned. Right, that you have, you set aside the time and resources. I'm friendly clear with open source projects who don't have it, but like yeah. big corporations that don't put out documentation drive me nuts, global scape. Um, it's not a call anybody out. Yeah, it's the same. <laughs> <Those guys. laughs> yeah. Okay, um, well, thank you for your time. No problem. I appreciate it.